Hello. Good morning, uh, Minister. I want to thank you for being here and also thank everyone joining us online. Welcome to the 2020 Annual Meetings uh, Governor Talks. As you know, today we are here with Minister Azucena Arbeleche. Uh, she took office on March 1st, 2020. A pretty good day to take office uh, during these pandemic times, just uh, three weeks before or two weeks before the world locked down to try to contain the spread of the virus. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Arbeleche uh, has a, a degree in economics and a master's in economic uh, policy. And she served previously for a long time in the Ministry of Finance of Uruguay, uh, most notably as the head of the debt management unit, uh, leading a, a huge transformation of debt policy in Uruguay. So with that, I mean, Azucena, welcome. Let's start, I think, from the obvious. I mean, Latin America has been severely hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. And in this environment, I mean, Latin America has 30% of the world cases, maybe 30% of the deaths. And this environment, I mean, Uruguay stands out as a country that has been able to contain the spread of the pandemic, to have a very a, a low mortality rate, and also, I mean, within the context of a world and a regional recession, to show macro numbers that also stand out in the region. So, so let's start from, from, from the epidemic, the pandemic, and tell us a little bit how Uruguay did to contain the pandemic, to be able to manage the pandemic uh, from a public health aspect, and then we can switch uh, to the economy. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you for, for the invitation to to have the opportunity to talk with you and to share Uruguay's case and to hear about other experiences. Let, let me take this opportunity also to thank the, the fund for its role during this pandemic. Um, it's, a very, it's a time of a lot of uncertainty and the, the analysis that the fund always performs, the, out, the global outlooks uh, are very important, but also the recommendations that under this uncertain world the, the fund has made, and also uh, the, the way that the fund has moved very quickly into uh, proposing different financial instruments to the countries. Uh, the, in our case, we haven't used the, the financial kits that the fund provides. Uh, we haven't needed to do that, but in many countries, I, I think that this has been essential. And financial stability is not all, but of course it helps to sail through this pandemic and to, to face the, the recovery that we all want to, to, to be there very, very soon. So thank you very much for the fun. Going to your question, uh, Alejandro, as you said, uh, this government took office on March 1st. And just weeks after that, we uh, heard that Uruguay had cases of COVID-19 in our country. So we had to immediately change our uh, agenda, or at least for some time, leave it on standby. We had been very uh, critical about the fiscal position, the fiscal situation that Uruguay had. So our starting point was quite complex with fiscal accounts and that were in, a, in bad shape, with a fiscal bird, with a debt burden that was very high. And we were already uh, going through a recession. So we had to leave that aside and we had to um, communicate to the people, to our people, that the focus now was to support everybody, especially those that are more vulnerable, to, so that they could say through this uh, pandemic. In, in that sense, we had to, very early, we had to um, take the decision not to go uh, on a world, on a general lockdown. Uruguay didn't go on a countrywide lockdown. So the decision was not easy and it was made during the first days. And what the government did was rather ask uh, its citizens to adhere to a voluntary um, um, freedom, to a voluntary uh, stay at home, um, uh, thinking that we appeal to individual freedom with responsibility. So it was more up to people if they went to work or not. Of course, our um, 
encouragement was to stay at home. And this was also uh, accompanied by a, a series of measures. We closed the land borders. All air traffic was also closed, except for the uh, repatriation flight so that our citizens could come back to Uruguay. We suspended all public events. We suspended uh, in-presence uh, school classes. We limited the visits in, to nursing houses that were going to be a problem because, of course, this was the mo most vulnerable, vulnerable um, population. And we encourage, as I said, people to stay at home. So um, I think it was important the way that we communicated all of this to the people. As I've said, we were beginning the administration with the idea that we had to uh, to grow and to improve our fiscal accounts. And now we had to uh, tell people uh, we are going to uh, care for everybody and we are going to support everybody through this pandemic. In that sense, it was important to uh, approve in Parliament uh, a uh, COVID-19 solidarity fund that we called, that on the one side, this uh, fund earmarked all the resources that were going to be allocated in addressing the emergency, but on the other side, it had the, the objective of communicating people that all the resources needed for the, the pandemic, whether so the, the, they're going to be social, economic, or sanitary resources, they were going to be uh, there. So um, particularly, you asked on the health measures. I, I would say that from the beginning, there was a very coordinated work amongst the ministries of health, um, foreign affairs and economy so that our main from the first weekend we were very much um, uh, focused in buying uh, abroad the ventilators that we we uh, uh, thought that we were going to need during the pandemic and we were worried about the preparation of ICU beds fortunately we didn't have to use them uh, but uh, we at the beginning this was a, a very big question and we had to address that quickly we made a lot of efforts in increasing the number of tests that were done every day and here it was very important the the support from the uruguayan scientific community and uh, up to the point that the community created, the scientific community created a national test procedure, and that has helped the increasing the number of tests very much. And uh, another uh, point very important in ter terms of health uh, procedures has been tracing, once we have a positive uh, case, the, the Ministry of Health traces all the contacts people that are, that have that could potentially have covid-19 and they uh, test for them so i think that uh, so far the results are, are good of course there's no room for complacency in in these situations but i think that the good results uh, re respond to a very strong leadership from the president a very strong communication from all government we had i would say at the beginning maybe every day we have we had a press conference showing what we were going to do and showing the uh, uh, cases or the issues where we had a lot of uncertainty. And also there has been a very good communication within members of government, the different ministries working together, but also the government with the private sector and the government with the scientific community. I mean, looking at the results, it's uh, so far pretty impressive, as, as you said, and it seems that... Uh, uh, I mean, a, a pretty uh, cohesive response by, by the population given this uh, uh, voluntary uh, lockdown uh, implemented, suggested by the government together with these uh, public health measures, uh, uh, focus very thoroughly on testing, trust, uh, uh, tracing, and, and, and obviously uh, uh, supporting a health system that I, I think in relationship to the rest of Latin America was already in relatively better shape in a region that, I mean, I, I think we, we have, I mean, significant shortcomings in, in, in health, but obviously Uruguay uh, uh, stood out on, on, on that front even before uh, uh, the, the pandemic hit. So, so you mentioned at the, at, at the beginning of your question, I mean, the, the initial conditions in which you, 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 you receive the economy of a relatively high inflation, uh, uh, a very tight uh, fiscal situation. So, so tell us a bit uh, w what were your original plans uh, uh, in terms of 
uh, moving forward towards uh, establishing a very clear uh, framework of uh, fiscal sustainability, a, a reduction of inflation, et cetera, and also how do these plans uh, change uh, due to the pandemic and at which stage uh, are you currently in the implementation of this, uh, e of this strategy? So, Alejandro, I wouldn't say that the plans changed. Mm -hmm. So what we did was just let, leave the plans aside for, for some time. And, and the focus was uh, into supporting, all, all of our focus changed into supporting people and uh, especially uh, the small and, and medium-sized uh, enterprises to, to walk through the, the pandemic. We still have uh, the medium-term agenda in place, uh, but maybe before moving into that, we, we can, I can... Um, share a little bit more of how we tackle the kind of, of measures that we took to uh, support people and enterprises through the pandemic. As, as I've said, it was very important to, to um, give confid confidence to people that the support was going to be there. And that's why we created this uh, COVID-19 fund. And this fund has uh, um, allocated resources into different areas. On the social fronts, we have um, given direct subsidies to people so that people could have basic needs satisfied people could uh, afford to to food which has been a which could be a problem in this uh, specific uh, times of of crisis and as uh, you said that uruguay has a, a good health system and that's true and we also have a very good safety net system however when we go through extraordinary situations like this when we see that those uh, systems are not enough and that still more has to be added. So in this case, uh, we found out that it was the, the support that self-employed people had, even they were working on the formal system, the, the, there wasn't uh, a good support for them when the activity came down. So we provided unemployment benefits for those people. We also uh, provided a new scheme uh, that allowed people to partially work and partially be under insurance uh, 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 and employment. So that here it was very important uh, not to, to keep the engines of the economy running. And that was a point that I personally made at, in one of these press conferences at the beginning of, of, the, of the sanitary crisis. Uh, it, we had this discussion, do we have to go to lock down the economy? Do we have to keep the, the, the sectors working? And we decided that the, the agents of the economy should continue run, running. Of course, the speed was going to be a very low speed and, uh, and maybe we had to uh, nearly uh, stop. But uh, the decision was not from the beginning, let's stop and uh, let, uh, let everybody be at home. So in that regard, we... Uh, gave this a incentive for workers so that they could for some some of the time be working and some of the time be uh, under this uh, scheme of uh, in insurance and employment insurance on the economic front we deferred uh, tax uh, payments we deferred uh, contributions to the social security system we subsidized some of these contributions to the social security system we deferred uh, payments, loan payments, and it this was done hand in hand with measures taken by the central bank. And I would say that the main instrument that we used during the crisis to help the, the, the small and medium-sized enterprises was uh, to be very um, proactive, very generous on the um, disbursements or, or, or the uh, um, loans to give um, accessibility of loans guaranteed by states. So these state guaranteed loans that uh, are around five points of GDP, not all of that has been dispersed so far. So far we have dispersed around one point of GDP, but it was important from the beginning to tell people, we have all these loans available to be used and they have the uh, guarantee of state. We saw that the this was, a, in terms, in economic terms, this was clearly a liquidity crisis, and we didn't want this, this liquidity crisis to turn into an insolvency crisis. So it, it was important to put, put all this liquidity into, into working. So that uh, related to the pandemic, but uh, as you said, we also had to keep an eye on the medium term and the the 
structural reforms. So in that regard, we had already been working on certain reforms that were, um, uh, were part of a law uh, that we presented in mid-April. So while we were in the beginning, while we were in the, in the middle of the pandemia, in the middle of April, one, just one month after we learned that the, we had the first cases of COVID-19, we sent to parliament a fast track uh, um, budget, no, uh, sorry, draft of law that was finally published, uh, approved at the, in the middle of July. And together with that, we have been working with the, the budget law that was presented at the end of August. And right now we are in the middle of the discussion in the House of Representatives in this in these days. So all of both both of these pieces of law, the urgent consideration law and the budget law, this help us move in terms of structural reforms uh, in the coming months. So it was important all, all of the time to keep like these two uh, things working at the same time. The what is uh, the immediate uh, support to the pandemic, but also looking a little bit beyond that and tackling these issues that you you were mentioning, not only on the fiscal front, but also on the on the monetary front. Thanks, Asusina. One, one question that comes up uh, in your in your description that maybe I mean some of our viewers uh, would be interested. Uh, I mean, what was the size of this uh, uh, COVID uh, response? Uh, budget or COVID response uh, uh, trust? And what are your plans for, for next year? I mean, given your projections for the economy, uh, you think that you will be able to, to, to undo it uh, fully or partially? So what are your uh, uh, thoughts regarding, uh, let's say, COVID uh, uh, support for, for households and uh, firms in 2021? And give us a little bit of a rough uh, idea of the size of, 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 of this whole effort that was very comprehensive mm -hmm. as you describe and how it was distributed between households and firms. So the uh, COVID-19 Solidarity Fund, we calculate, we estimate that for, for the whole year, it will amount to $800 million. And that is uh, roughly 1.5 points of GDP uh, for, mm -hmm. for Uruguay. We are not... Uh, coronavirus, uh, coronavirus fund or COVID-19 fund, we are not considering the uh, guarantees that we give in this loan. So that's something additionally, and that counts, only that counts to five points of GDP. So uh, this will have an impact in terms of fiscal result. We began this administration with a fiscal deficit of, uh, of five points of GDP, and a, a, debt, a gross debt in terms of GDP of uh, 60, nearly 65% of GDP. And we, uh, we think that this year, the fiscal uh, deficit will go up to 6.5% of GDP, partly because of this fiscal effect of the COVID-19, and also partly because we think that the economy will, will uh, further decrease its activity, and that will have a consequence in terms and impact in terms of, of less uh, tax collection. Um, after that, we, we plan to uh, increase, to improve the fiscal accounts so that finally debt to GDP stabilizes. I think it's important that uh, while we were thinking and um, moving forward with these uh, uh, different actions, at the same time, as I've said, in the urgent consideration law and in the budget law, we are presenting a new institutional fiscal institutionality. Mm. So there are different points, one of which is the measurement of a structural balance. Uh, up to now, Uruguay, which has... Which very uh, or quite deep uh, business cycles didn't have any structural um, balance for uh, by which to uh, compare the results. Now we do have our objective, uh, fiscal objective is in terms of a structural balance. We are trying to move forward in terms of having a counter-cyclical policy. We are also um, providing a ceiling in terms of the expenditure that the central government can make. And a third point is that we have a ceiling in terms of the indebtedness that the central government can have. So all of these points are part of a new fiscal uh, institutionality that will help us gain credibility that 
we have lost because the previous administration announced uh, results that were not uh, fulfilled uh, in any of the years. So we have to move in that area uh, once, and that that's why it was also important to have the, the this fund. So at the end of the day, we can measure what if our expenditure has increased because of the COVID-19 or because we uh, deployed the resources into something else. Now that's, uh, I mean, it's very interesting, especially, I mean, your whole agenda regarding creating a very strong institutional framework that uh, oversees or, or guides a fiscal policy to provide a very clear anchor in terms of your uh, medium term uh, debt sustainability and, and fiscal sustainability. Uh, let's turn a little bit at the structural uh, uh, changes uh, that, that you think are needed uh, for Uruguay to, 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 to accelerate growth and to, and to continue in this path of uh, inclusive growth, but more accelerated uh, growth. And, and where do you see the engines of growth in the next, uh, in the next few years? What are the, the key structural uh, issues that need to be unlocked, uh, reforms that need to be implemented for this growth uh, acceleration potential to, be, uh, uh, to happen? So Alejandro, I mentioned some of these reforms. The institutional reform for us is very important. There are also monetary reforms that are another part of this uh, new institutionality, uh, better communication, more transparency, and the objective of the central bank being lowering, lowering inflation and not having many objectives at the same time. We have made also, um, we are making progress in terms of a new governance for the public enterprises. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, what we need are uh, lower utility tariffs that because that's part of the problem that we have in terms of competitivity for the country. And that is uh, one of the main problems what, why the growth has, has been so so poor. We also are present, have presented uh, the need to have a pension reform. Uh, we need to have um, to guarantee the pensions for uh, for our people for the next years, and we need also to guarantee the sustainability of this pension. So there's also a fiscal side to this. We are being more, much more uh, proactive in terms of um, trade policy. We need more results. We need to have Uruguayans goods to access market on more beneficial um, con uh, con beneficial. Um, uh, uh, consider beneficial aspects and uh, but equally important is not only to have these reforms in that we are pushing in our laws but is to promote investment because if we want to grow and if, if we want to have more employment what we need is more investment and investment uh, particularly private investment has been lacking behind in Uruguay for many years now so in that sense one of the main drivers will be in the in uh, private investment and we have been very active in changing the uh, the investment promotion regime that Uruguay has ha has so far we have published uh, a new regime for housing for the more vulnerable sectors. We have uh, published a new regime for a big ticket construction. And um, uh, just some days uh, ago, we published a new regime where we extend the benefits of fiscal benefits for the projects, for investment projects, and we extend also the kind of sectors that can be included in this in these uh, tax incentives. We, are also, uh, we have also presented changes in the tax residence. We want to further uh, gain families, to have families and foreign investment coming into Uruguay. Our rules of the games are very clear. That is a, 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 an asset that we have, uh, and we have had for many years. So we think that uh, it, it's uh, important to show this and to make it um, to have a more friendly uh, entry for uh, families and investment into into our country. Oh, it's a, I mean, again, a pretty impressive uh, agenda. And as you said, I mean, a, a, the combination of a strong fiscal framework, a pension reform, 
more certainty on the monetary uh, policy side and, and the clear objective uh, of, of having uh, low and, and stable inflation together with all these uh, sectoral issues on the public enterprise and a, a, a stimulus for, for, for investment. I mean, a, a, it seems like a, a pretty aggressive and, and complex issue also to, to deal with, a, w with Congress and, and, and it's an impressive and very full agenda. Let's uh, maybe uh, finish uh, with, uh, with the environment. Uh, Uruguay performs uh, extremely well yeah. on environment, social, and governance uh, fundamentals. Uh, and, and obviously, given the, uh, the global concern regarding uh, climate change uh, and, and the impact of that climate change will have on, on, on the environment, uh, on our cities, on, on, on our ways of, of living, uh, tell us a little bit more about what uh, Uruguay's strategy on this uh, dimension. Yes, first of all, uh, as you mentioned, Alejandro, Uruguay uh, historically has a very good uh, position in terms of uh, the fundamentals, in terms of environment, social, and, and governance. That is not new for our country. Uh, some days ago, Fitch uh, published its um, uh, its report where it kept the investment grade status for Uruguay, and all of these uh, factors were mentioned, and they, they are very important. And I would say that Uruguay stands very good in terms of democracy, in terms of human rights, and in terms of freedom, not only in the region, but also in, on an international comparison. Let us remember that Uruguay is one of the 22 countries with full democracy, according to the economy, economy, Economist Index. So uh, in that regard, the environmental um, is very important for us and uh, and finally, we have in this urgent consideration law, we uh, created the Ministry of Environment, wh which I would say will have on the one side a very uh, economic uh, um, approach in terms of the punishment and incentives in the way that people treat the environment. And on the other side, the, the objective would be to safeguard the natural resources that we have. Uruguay is a country with... Um, beautiful beaches, land, rivers, uh, all of which are a national pride for all of, you, of us Uruguayans, and we are all committed to preserve these uh, natural resources. The, the brand uh, Uruguay Natural, Uruguay Natural, has been the way how Uruguay has presented itself to the world in the last years, and, for, uh, and that shows the way that uh, the importance that we give to these natural resources. We are very lucky to have them. It is our responsibility to care for them so that the next generations uh, can have and uh, the benefit of using also these resources. No, I I mean, uh, I think we've covered, I mean, a, a lot of topics. Uh, maybe, uh, Azucena, you would like to, to, to give our viewers uh, what's your outlook for, for the Uruguayan economy in 20 and 21. And although you've already described it, maybe summarize and, and, and let's finish with uh, what you, you consider the main medium term challenges for your country. It's nicer to comment on 2021 than 2020 <laughs> in terms of outlook. For 2020, we expect a decline of GDP of 3.5%. This is not uh, uh, bad if we compare what, what is the case for, for other countries in the world, but of course, it's, it's not good. The, the good side of this is that after a very hard second quarter where the GDP uh, uh, fell uh, nearly 11% on an interannual basis, we are right now seeing uh, quite a lot of indicators that we are uh, beginning to face the, the recovery so that we will be uh, going through this V-shape in terms of activity. Uh, that is the case with the indicator of, of uh, car sales, the tax collection, and I would say the demand for fuel also shows that we are under this recovery. For next year, we um, project a, a rebound of the economy of 4.3%. And the, for the years after that, the economy will be growing around 3%. Of course, much of these numbers depend on the impact that the structural reforms that we are pushing forward have. 
Uh, in terms of the challenges ahead, I think that I mentioned some of them uh, during this uh, talk. Uh, I would add to those challenges, uh, those that are related to research and innovation, because one of the one of the things that we have learned during this uh, crisis in Uruguay is that the we can have a very good outcome when uh, research and the and the and government work together and. Uh, in that sense, we are planning and we have the challenge to be much more innovative in terms of uh, having um, better education, better technical centers, uh, and better and pushing in private investment into this area. So we can make a difference in, in terms of innovation and technology, um, being a small country, but I think that th this is an area where we have a, a good opportunity. And I think that the, the work, the very collaborative work with the academia, in this case with the scientific academia in Uruguay, and being uh, pushing the, the, the topics to the, the, uh, the, the edge uh, 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 in many areas, I think has uh, shown us that we do have a, an opportunity in that sense. Uh, maybe the last point that for us, it's a talent, an important talent, is related to gender equality. And in that uh, sense, the approach that we have in Uruguay is very practical. And what we are uh, moving, the way we are, we are pushing is moving resources into very concrete results. So we need to have resources allocated so that uh, uh, we don't have, so we support women that face violence in their homes and so on. Mm. Uh, it's not uh, only at the discussion that's important, but co concrete support so that we uh, make progress in this area. So I would say that the, the challenges uh, are, are not new. Uh, what at the end, what we, uh, we are um, committed into giving our uh, people or our Uruguayans or all the people that live in our country a uh, better quality of life. And in that sense, what we need is uh, people to have more freedom so that, that they can choose by themselves the project of life that they want to, to have. And in that way, we are all contributing to have a more coercive and more diversified uh, society. Minister, uh, thank you very much for your time and, and for this very clear and, and enlightening uh, uh, discussion on the current state, but uh, more so on the future and the plans that you and, and President Lacalle Po have for, for your country. I also want to thank everyone for joining us at these virtual governor talks of the 2020 annual meetings. Again, thank you very much.